to the Independent Musician. Our weekly podcast will focus on the independent artist and the music market at large. You'll hear from those artists as well as music execs, tech experts, and marketing leaders from around the globe. We'll discuss what it takes to make it in the biz and how you can overcome obstacles as you progress your craft, all the while making it interesting and fun. Now, here's your host, Mark Skoda. Hey, welcome. This is Mark Skoda, the host of the Independent Musician Podcast. And we got one of our artists today from Iron Gate Records. I'm looking forward to sharing with you. They've got some great background, very interesting group of guys who've played internationally. And, well, they've even played in Japan. So we're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. And then, frankly, what they're doing today and where they're going. So I'd like to introduce the Aaron Ball Band. And, uh, well, we've, we've we determined that he's the leader for tonight, although his bandmates don't always agree. But this will be Aaron Ball joining us. Aaron, why don't you introduce us to the band? Hello, guys. I'm Aaron. And yes, I'll be the leader tonight. To my right, immediately, would be Mr. Jared Smith. Hello, my name is Jared Smith, and I play the drums in the band. That's the most important it's instrument of all. We know that. That's what my son tells me. Well, you know, you like Snoop Dogg says, you let other people tell you how gangster you are. You don't say that, <laughs> right? That, here's Gangsta Dave. And then, yeah, speaking of gangster, here is Super Dave. Super for Dave, is that that's me? Yeah. yeah, I'm the keyboard player of the Aaron Ball Band and well, bass sometimes. Sometimes, yeah, you other things. play the left hand heavy, right? Yep. Well, guys, thanks for joining me tonight. You have to. That's right. Well, exactly. For us. Well, great. You know, um, obviously, uh, I don't know how many podcasts you've done, and doing a three way is always interesting. You know, so we'll keep the names with the vocals as much as we can. But um, you know, starting out, I, I guess. Maybe, Aaron, I'll ask you, you know, you obviously have named the band and, and you've obviously been with these guys a while and some you've had some iterations of other members of the band. Can you tell us a little bit about, you know, when did you get this started? When were you playing music? And maybe a little bit of background of the band before we get to where you are today. Well, originally, uh, I, I played in multiple bands. Um, and this band kind of came about, ooh, 2014. I would say is when we Dave's given the boss maybe, over there is telling me 2012, 2012, 13. <laughs> so yeah. Anyway, um, you know the name is always an interesting thing. I've I've never played in a band with my own name attached to it, but uh, it got to the point where different group of musicians, depending on where we're touring, where we're playing, you know, we can go from anywhere from me doing a solo show to doing a duo with uh with david and myself or a three piece as we've got sitting here tonight the last show we did i think we had seven people on stage with us oh very so, cool you know part of the so, name yeah part of the name goes along with just the the one consistency thing is that someone has to own it and if you have a band name there's kind of expectations with that um, and there's kind of a story i have with that too so uh, how long have dave and jared been with you then since obviously we we I think David corrected you and it's 2012. So how long have David and Jared been with you? David, obviously, I think you've been from the beginning. Is that right? Well, I was there in 2012, and I think it had just changed kind of uh, from its previous Aaron Ball band from its previous um, conception into the Aaron Ball band right about 2012. Cool. That's and why Jared, Jared's the leader of the band. <laughs> uh, Jared, when when did you join? I'm trying to remember. I think I joined. Wasn't it about 2014? Um, I played a gig in a uh, pops orchestra with a guitar player. And he was like, you know, I know this cool guy. Love to have you play drums with him. Never played a gig with that guitar player with this band. Yeah. All of a sudden, I found a place. You found a home. Found there you go. Home. Now, where and you guys... All of us have played in multiple bands. You know, Dave and I actually met playing... I was playing drums in another band that he was playing keyboard in. And that's how we got together. And, you know, Jared obviously got t together with us through a mutual friend. And, and we've all played and continue to play in other uh, musical groups as we go. So so all, uh, all of you have been playing music uh, most of your lives, all of your lives. Um, Aaron, how long have you been in the music side of the things? Before? I mean, I know you probably have a day job, too, as most artists do. But how long have you been playing? <laughs> well, I've been a – I started playing – like drums in the junior high in the band class that's when mm -hmm. I, I learned to play the you know drum set while i was in detention <laughs> okay <laughs> that's, that's how i so i started out as a drummer in detention i my uh, teacher played the little mermaid songs and i learned to play the drums to the little mermaid 
and uh <laughs> that's funny <laughs> i've never got much better at it but that's uh that's where i got my starts as a drummer in uh, junior high david you're obviously on keys have you been playing keys since a young age as well oh yeah my my folks put me in piano lessons when i was four four or five and uh I uh, turned it into a part-time job in right after I got out of high school. Accompanied choirs through the school districts mm-hmm. here in Idaho, and uh, did that for a while. So yeah, I've been I've been playing for for my lifetime. You know, I learned I took piano lessons for about six years, and I was about oh, I think I was ten to about sixteen. And uh, back then, and that's a long time ago, uh, they only taught you know the classic method of piano instruction i'll never forget i had an old lady who was my teacher um my mom used to take me to her house nice lady but nobody asks me to sit down and play the play the greg concerto or chopin these days and they never taught you how to break chords they never taught you about pop music and frankly it just sort of went away because i could never be part of a rock band you know playing that stuff and you know just frankly the educational process was very different and i had some talent for it but i wouldn't say talented right but i did love it and so today i'm you know i'm a frustrated band member but i get to play this uh with all the bands that I manage through Iron Gate Records and frankly through my son's band. So I get a little bit of uh, ancillary benefit of all of that as well. And Jared, you, you're obviously drumming. How long have you been drumming? Oh, I've been drumming since I was uh, 14. Started in the band in school and a couple years later uh, started doing it, I guess, professionally because I started getting paid. I started playing in the bars and stuff, but I had to take my mommy with me. <laughs> That's right. You were underage. <laughs> yes. So I'd have nothing's changed. No. No. So I'd have old ladies trying to buy me drinks, and I'd be like, Mom's here. So "That's great." Mom, <laughs> mom, I'm, I'm going to be tied up for a little while. <laughs> so obviously, music's been a passion for all of you, and clearly, I know that uh, from backgrounds we've had conversations previously you guys all have day jobs as well um i'm interested you know aaron we talked about a time when you guys did some cruise ship work maybe by yourself or with other bandmates in the previous life before the current incarnation of the band and i think you even played you said in japan tell us a little bit about that and what what came first the the japanese gig or the uh cruise ship gigs well, where do we start, Dave? <laughs> so, I mean, to start with all our international stuff here back in 2013. 13. I, I, uh, I had a song that I released that did very well overseas, and I was working with a guitar company had an opportunity to uh, move to New Zealand. Before that time, I always thought I was a rock and roll kind of guy. Moving to New Zealand as an American, I became a country guy, and uh, that, that's just kind of was a stigma. When people would see me, they'd want to know where my boots and hat were. And, and uh, <laughs> Because you're an American, right? Because, I'm, yeah, I'm American, right? And so, uh, you know, it kind of started shifting that way years ago. Ended up in New Zealand for a while. Uh, came back to the States. And since then, uh, we've been back. Dave and I have toured in New Zealand. Uh, I've toured in Australia. Uh, did a little bit in Brazil. And then what happened is about 2018, 17? Yeah. Dave will tell us the Let's right see. date because he well, remembers these things. Then we went back to New Zealand together. In 14. In uh, Christmas of 14, 15. Yeah. And then we just decided, hey, we want to go to Japan and play music. What do we have to do to go to Japan to play music? Yeah. So in about that same time, um, I actually won a couple songwriting awards. Hmm. And we kind of, and that was kind of what I guess prompted it. it. And we just. Yeah followed those coattails and found a way into Japan and yeah it's it's a you know you it's an interesting world as an unknown artist to get into Japan and play music you gotta find some help yeah well and it's interesting when we when we started looking at the Japanese tour initially I reached out to a, a guy named Dwayne who was uh he actually wrote a book well before we decided to go to Japan we songwriting that one of the offices of the place where we got the some of the awards was in Tokyo so we, we started looking, you know, and doing some research, and there's a book written about touring in Japan. And I started reading, you know, reading through the book, and it basically says, you know, as an independent artist, you, you can't come to Japan. It's just not going to work. There's just no way. And uh, in order to play there, here's kind of how it works. And so we were a little defeated on that, but we started reaching out to, to promoters and bookers and agencies in Japan and ended up getting a response from somebody who ended up being the guy who wrote the book about how to get a tour in Japan. <laughs> I'll be and, darned. Uh, he was our tour manager for our first what, week or 10 days we, we were there. Yeah, we were there for two weeks. 
weeks. Yeah. yeah. And so I uh, met a lot of great people. But while we were out there, with the success of some of the things we had done at the time, we were uh, approached by an agency um, booking cruise ships. So while we were in Japan, we got we got asked to uh, go work for, for Carnival Cruise Lines. And so when we got back from Japan, we turned around and went out on a boat. Just that fast. Yeah. And so Dave we, and I became the country duo. We didn't even have to audition to yeah. go out on that cruise ship. Cruise. That's crazy, right? I mean, it, it, it's interesting. Uh, you know, I, um, as I've promoted some of our artists, uh, even my son's band, for instance, they do really well internationally with uh, streams. A lot of people, I, I think there's, there's first of all, an, uh, an affection for American music generally, right? I mean, uh, mm-hmm. just as we had that same affection for the British invasion, right? Um, I think the fact that it's different. Different. And in particular, you know, having lived in Japan for three years myself, I, I can remember just as a side note, I would sing karaoke with my Japanese colleagues. And I'll never forget the one day some guy was in the bar comes up to me. Oh, you sing English very well. I went to myself. Yeah, because I'm a damn American, you know. But but uh, it was a lot of fun. And, and Japan is a very cool place. And I think you probably uh, were enjoyed by a lot of people. That's uh, that's pretty slick. Very slick. Yeah. I mean, we we played hard rock cafes. We played some. We actually made money touring in Japan, which is, you know, we like I said, we kind of, we were told, you might be able to get a show here. You're going to be paying, and and we ended up walking away from Japan with money in our pockets from the gigs we played. That's good. It's well, really the Japanese people, you know, will pay. I think that's the other reality. They're not sort of trying to to uh, you know get everything for nothing. They they understand the cost and the value of of, of talent, et cetera, because as a country, as you know, they are about the visual arts and in particular, you know, the cultural elements. And of course, music is part of that. So I'm glad to hear you had that kind of experience. How about the cruise ship gig, right? I mean, I've heard, you know, that can be really a, a beat down because you're you're on shows all day long, possibly, you know, seven days a week until you're in port. Um, tell us a little bit about that experience. It'd be kind of interesting to hear. Well, we, uh, that's, that's about right. We, we played, uh, you know, when we first were asked to go out on the ship we we sent a copy of our current set list of covers we play a lot of original music normally but we sent out a set list of covers and thought okay that if they want us they'll book us with the with the covers that we currently play and uh, we walked on a ship on on a sunday morning and said and they told us you're going to play this song and this song and this song tonight at 6 p.m and we're like holy we had never <laughs> played it before <laughs> <laughs> so so our song le- list expanded from you know maybe a hundred and hundred covers ish to about 300 in about a week's time we oh my gosh so when when you do that and obviously you know i'm always first of all always amazed even in you know some of the people i work with the musicians mind right i'm always amazed that they can even you know basically memorize all that music and just have it in their heads in many cases but in in having to do sort of on the fly adding all those songs to the set list were you allowed to use a lyric at all or did you have to sort of learn that for the night and then get on to the next batch i mean that's a lot of pressure how did that work you know we had our cheat sheets you every musician on cruise ships has an ipad with them yeah that uh, helps them through piano bar from the piano bar to the string ensemble to the the show band. Everybody's got their their uh, their iPad or computer, what you know, some sort of electronic device to help through. Just because they need such a large repertoire. Of music. Right, right. And you're playing. Well, in our case, we were playing between five and six hours a day. Wow. And averaging about six and a half days a week, sometimes seven, sometimes six. So it was... Uh, and that's just the playing. That's not that, the... Every set you tear down, set yeah. back up. So yeah, it's yeah. A, it is a uh, it's a taxing job, but a, a really rewarding job it's, too. It's, if you want to have a job on a cruise ship, the best job is a musician by oh. far. It's so much fun. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, the accolades you often get, and you got everybody there who's going to be having a good time, want to have a good time, and so I imagine there's a lot of uh, uh, a lot of fun with the crowds and, and, frankly, the adulation that you as a musician often get if you're good, and uh, in particular, uh, uh, you know, the environments are pretty, you know, glamorous in the sense that, you know, it's the front of house, right, as opposed to the hallways of the of the utility closets, Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, and I think of our crew. What do we have? Uh, fourteen hundred. There were there were fourteen hundred crew on yeah. the ship, and there yeah. were eleven American. Oh wow! 
Okay. So, so being an American as well as being musicians, we were we were treated very well and, and really enjoyed it. But a good good time. And but got paid. A lot of fans, right? Like a lot of people from Texas. Yeah, that's probably we ported in Galveston and being a country country act in Galveston on a ship. I mean, we've we've really amassed quite a following, you know, in Texas because of that. And that mm-hmm. was, I mean, no. and because of COVID, we decided that we were gonna <laughs> go do a, a house tour. Because no one was playing music anywhere. Well, so right before COVID, I was 95% done with booking us a tour in Iceland, remember? Yeah. Yeah, because at that time... Um, and Jared, had, this is at the point you you had joined the band as well. And, and oh, yeah. You were, now, you were now going out as a three-piece, right? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So we... Yeah, back in 2020, we were... Yeah, we were trying to book that around the same time that we went and performed um, at NAM down in Orange County. Oh, sure. Um, and we were trying to book that Iceland tour because, yeah, we had about 50, 75 listeners in Iceland. And it was very close to confirmation until the apocalypse. So. <laughs> right. Interesting. So, yeah, as, Dave, as David was saying, we just decided we're going to go see our friends in town. And uh, so we packed up his his station wagon car as small a setup as we could get and drove drove down to Dallas and worked our way down south from Dallas and I mean it's actually probably the most money we've ever made on a tour and we didn't charge. We just played in people's houses and their yards and their and they just invited their families and we just had a, a great two weeks of fun partying with lots of people from Texas mm-hmm. at their and they had a great time inviting all their friends to just come have a big party at their house with music. Yeah, because everybody was sort of locked down, and yep. oh, and, yeah, it, and it wasn't a lot of fun. I mean, we had you know we have a here in Nashville at the time it was also pretty much closed down. But you know, some of my guys, including my son's band, was playing down in um, they were playing, I should say, down in uh, uh, Murray County, which is uh, south of us here, and they were open the whole time. And so you know, people didn't put up with that whole closed down thing and masking and all that nonsense. And frankly, it was a lot of fun. So you played where you could play. And you got out when you could get out, and that was uh, obviously what you guys did as well. I mean, if you love music, whether you're playing for one person or a thousand people, you play your best because you never know who's there, and you never know who they're going to tell, and you never know how you build the next fan relationship, right? Right. And we call I mean, the one thing that I think we're, we're proud of as a band is that the places we are regulars, our places that we tour and play, they're our family. You know, these people go from being fans to being family, and we're close with them. And that's, you know, it's all about that personal relationship and connection. And, I mean, that's why we play music in the first place. And, right. And, you know, we've been very blessed and fortunate to be able to do, to do what we love and build those kind of relationships with people. So as you yeah. sort of, you know, evolve now, and I know that, you know, when we, when you've joined Iron Gate Records label uh, with us, you know, um, we talked a lot about sort of getting into the next sort of level in terms of your digital currency, right? In other words, where you're at in terms of everything from social media to promotion to streaming, et cetera. And, you know, you obviously have gotten great reaction from your fan base live shows and, and that's critically important. But, you know, as I've shared with you and we've talked to many times on this show is that being able to evidence your fan base through some of the analytics of social media and ticket sales and things of that nature um sort of is that where you see yourselves now is that frankly one of the reasons that you know uh, and I'll, I'll ask the just from the audience perspective why did you decide to do this deal with iron gate records as an independent label this is all about jared <laughs> jared go ahead so i but i like to pride myself being able to hustle a little bit one of know. his best qualities is his humility <laughs> hey listen if he was getting you a gig in iceland for gosh sake that paid money you got to give the guy the kudos come on yes we i do. most americans don't know where the hell iceland is exactly <laughs> it so, sounds cold <laughs> yeah anyway i i so for me i've been on and off with the Aaron ball band for a little while just because of various things with other bands that i've been working with and whatnot And I found myself in a point where I could focus a lot of my energy towards this band. And that, you know, as a drummer, there's a certain amount that you, um, if you, if that's the most expectation, that's not a lot. And that's kind of sad to say, you know, but it is what it is. So I knew I had more to offer. So I was trying to get the, the band to get to the next level. And I was hitting a lot of walls, uh, you know, because I, I was able to get a lot of things going for us. I got us a lot of playlist listens, 
got us a few gigs. But honestly, it, it got to the point where there's certain festivals, certain gigs that we, we, we know we're good enough to do. And that's coming from a humble place. We, we get a good reaction when we play. And we, we, we do better on the bigger stage. We do better with more enthusiastic than just playing at Joe's Bar. You right. know, that's mm-hmm. not where we want to be. And so I actually have met Greg Upchurch a few times of Three Doors Down, and he and I are friends on Facebook, and he posted about Iron Gate Records. Right, and yeah. But I checked you guys out, and it was between you and another one where I was like, we need the representation. We need the, the publishing help so that we can be on TV or movies. We need the playlisting help, and very much so, we need the booking help to get us to the next level, which it already has. Like, um, honestly, we use... A record label as kind of that and we're not the only bands that do this a lot of bands do this where they use the record label as an unseen kind of big brother aspect while negotiating right it's the i mean there is there is a that's one of the reasons i started there is a cachet to at least being with a label and when you see 20 different artists on a label they say hmm this is kind of legit you know and uh maybe these guys do have something going on so at the very least you get a second look right yeah and people give us more notoriety and clout like when i when we we posted that we were joining the iron gate family we had a whole bunch of people reach out to us individually you know saying like oh you guys have made it you guys are well on your way and it's Mm -hmm. like we're we're the same band it's just now with iron gates help we can hopefully be able to show the world what we already have going because right. that's the biggest thing. There's so much media out there. It's hard for people to sift through, through all the SoundCloud rappers and people that, you know, everybody can do it and everybody can sound halfway decent at it. But to actually showcase that we write, we record and perform fairly well. Mm-hmm. And we need, you know, and that's what we wanted when we got in with Iron Gate is to have that representation to show the world, you know, what you saw in us. You yeah, you know, I, and I think from my perspective, you know, that's why I, I was even surprised on some of the streaming numbers. I thought to myself, well, this is actually really good music. And, you know, I think at the end of the day, you know, it really is about just putting all this together in a manner that really allows um, allows you guys to do what you do best, but also to expand your horizons, as we talked about, into the broader ecosystem. So I'm I'm glad we're able to do that. I, I You know, we don't have everything buttoned up. I mean, as Iron Gate Records, you know, we continually add more functionality. We as you know, I've had conversations to recently, to, which I'll be sharing with uh, with our our uh, artists and with uh, our listeners, uh, related to agency relationships and the like. And I think part of this is what you know what we try to bring to bear that a lot of individual artists can't is sort of the connectivity to the music industry at large, even this podcast, right? I mean, I've got people. I'm talking to all the time, which not only helps me as a label rep, as the owner of the company, but also helps me communicate if the artists are inclined to spend 45 minutes to listen right that they will learn something that they don't already know and i think that's valuable as well so i I appreciate your comments and i think you know we we continually try to build more functionality more capability and and to be fair it's it's not a slam dunk as you know in this business today you know i've talked to venues and uh you know they get a thousand reach outs a week you know from artists wanting to play because Everybody wants to get out and touring, touring now has begun to take a back seat because of the costs of touring, right? And so people are finding out that to put on a a two or three week tour is just not economically feasible for the artists themselves. Uh, And so I think, you know, localization or what I call regionalization, you know, where I call it the, you know, the five hour drive time, right? People are more inclined to do that today than they are to go across the country playing in different venues. It's just a harder, it's a harder game to play today. Well, and it's, it's not that, oh, we have Iron Gate now. I don't have to do anything. I work harder now because I I don't want you to do what we already have. You, the way that we want the label to work with us, and most artists should, I think, is a help meet to be able to fill in the gaps that we, with our years of experience with, you know, different um, venues, different connections that we have, you know, those are exhausted at a point and we just need, so... 
just because we have the label, we're still working hard. Right, exactly. I think that's important because the label, you know, first of all, doesn't do everything all the time. And secondly, you know, our economic model is one that, you know, aff affiliates with the artist and assists the artist, but doesn't do everything for the artist. It's one, we can't keep, you know, pricing where it is if we do that. And two, you know, it doesn't allow the artist to grow in understanding their own business. You know, you, you're our brand as well as a band, and you have to be treating it as a business so that you know that you make money. How do you monetize all the work that you're doing? So, you know, for me, it's a, it's a real joy because I get to deal with people like yourselves and, you know, to be helpful and at the same time recognize that we continue to learn together and offer more insights and hopefully add more value as we go along. And I think that's what's, that's what's cool about an ecosystem like Iron Gate Records. When you have a number of different artists who are joining the label, who you're working with and what's working well for certain ones may work well for others and vice versa. And more importantly, you know, you're constantly understanding markets and understanding regions and all of that sort of gets accumulated in the knowledge base of Iron Gate that then can be disseminated across other artists. And I think that's something else that's unique. It's, you know, you can go it alone today and a lot of artists do, but, uh, you know, to learn everything that you need to learn and to use all the technology that you need and to be able to recognize what's happening across the industry oftentimes is overwhelming, right? And therefore, I think as an independent label, that's what we try to sort of offer up in the context of our relationships with uh, Aaron Ballban and others. Well, nobody does it on their own. Like Chance the Rapper, he's the first um, artist to perform on Saturday Night Live. Oh, yeah, that that's right. have a label, but, but he outsources. So it's similar to what Iron Gate already is, that it's not like you guys are going to take 50% of everything. And if we want a tour bus, you take 75%. Right, it's right. That it's a lot more customizable to what our needs are and every other artist on the roster. Well, I think, and to your point, Jared, that's a, that is exactly the model, right? It's to say, all right, you know, first of all, roll your own because everybody has a different economic pain point, right? Some people can spend more money. Bands may have more money because they can accumulate costs across multiple members. Singer-songwriters may not. And, and of course, depending on everyone's jobs and positions, you know, and current economic situation, even inflation as we sit here today, and even being able to pay for the gas, uh, you know, money uh, impacts all of that. So one of the things we've tried to do, and as you recognize, is transparency in all pricing and basically mark up a service fee, but allow you to say, can we do this? And here's the economic benefit of that uh, versus, you know, you should spend four or $5,000 a month and go broke trying to do what you're doing. So uh, to your point, I think it's, it's important for artists to recognize that ownership of their business, their brand, and of course their music, and of course uh, their associated uh, touring, et cetera, is also facilitated by the label and the label itself should be able to give them all that benefit without actually handcuffing them or more importantly, making them broke right that's critical yeah and it's it's interesting you know um back in i don't know 2017 2018 the last record i put out i was recording it down in new orleans played it uh or recorded it at a, the parlor studio which is a, a pretty pretty fantastic facility down in new orleans the producer was a guy named tom drummond he's a he plays in a band called better than ezra a friend of mine and uh you know he was kind of going over what i had accomplished and you know the recordings and some of the things i've done and he says so who is your label and at that time obviously we hadn't didn't have a label mm -hmm. and he was you know quite quite surprised that we were able to accomplish as much as we have without label affiliation and it's been a lot of work so you know our relationships and our touring venues and and everything we've done we've done independently up to this point and as jared said at some point in time you kind of reach a, a wall where that's that's about as far as you can go as an independent artist uh, and that's not entirely true i mean like you said chance the rapper macklemore is a great yeah great, but they don't do it on on their own still there's it takes a takes a village and and when you have a whole lot of people pulling in the same direction at the same time that's when you get a lot of things accomplished, and that's what we're looking for. So as you sort of look to the future, I mean, what, where, where would you want to see your band in the next five years? I mean, you, that's a pretty reasonable expectation. Are you, you know, do you see yourself? I mean, at this point, you obviously have your day jobs, uh, you know. It, well, everyone wants to quit their day, day job right. and just play music, I think. Right. We've done it. I've done it. Yeah, I've no, retired we, about six times. Am I going to be alive in five years? That's a big question. Jeez. Yeah, that's right. Is well, Dave? All right, we'll give you, th we'll give you three <laughs> years, Dave, okay? <laughs> um, I, it's always been about connecting with people and wanting to sh connect with more and more people and meeting people and sharing things with people. 
and because that's what our music we feel like our, our music is about is finding ways to connect with people and we just feel really good when we can do that and so the more we can connect with more people better it feels I mean, that's what, a lot of it is why you play music is how it makes you feel. Yeah, I've always said that music sort of is that connection to the soul, you know, that above all other things, I mean, there are the visual arts, but music because of the impact of the analog wave on a human being, right? From the physiology of that baseline thumping across your chest, so to speak, to just the auditory stimulation of that very same analog sound is really fascinating. And I think more than just seeing something, experiencing it and, and listening and, and then tying that in with the musicality of, of the melody and the instruments themselves, the vocalists, and of course the, 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 the lyrics themselves, all of which are really extraordinary and, and an experience that I would argue few other, few other arts can even ever achieve, in my opinion. Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, as, as we got together with you, um, if you remember our first meeting before we, uh, before we decided to join the family, I think my, my question to you was, why us? Right. Because at the end of the day, you know, we're looking for a partnership, but we as Jared said, you know, we, we believe in what we're doing. We, we feel like we have uh, something that's valuable and something that can reach people. And, you know, if we can make a, make somebody's day a little better and connect with somebody in a way that nobody else can, that's important to us. And so we wanted that same from you, you know, right. have, do you have that connection? And, and that was kind of our, our decision-making question on, on our end of things is, you know, are you that person that believes in what we do too? Because we want that partnership with somebody that, that believes in us. So I want to turn to your music for a moment because obviously one of the things that um, I've enjoyed in this current release of New Strings, the EP you just released on October 17th, you know, I would encourage everybody to get out there to all your streaming platforms and frankly to give a listen to Aaron's uh, band and, and the music that they're putting out there now. And we're going to be doing some playlist work and some additional promotion uh, with the release here. It's sort of... Uh, been a, an effort to go through and you know analyze but i i, I want to play one of the songs here because i would like you to tell me you know and tell the audience frankly sort of what's your favorite of the you know six songs that came out of the new strings ep and by the way again it's at spotify under aaron ball band uh and you know please uh please definitely check that out it's actually under aaron ball is the uh is the uh, artist name because uh as aaron knows you've got to sort of s- specify what who gets identified in in Spotify? So you know, obviously, there's six great songs, and and I think you know, I I, I would not classify this as pure country. I think there's a there's a, a a ballad element to this. There's a story element to this, and I think even in some of the songs, you know, a bit more of a rock sound. Um, is that a fair assessment? It's a unique thing to be a country artist because we're not really when people hear country, there's still kind of a genre associated with that right Mm -hmm. Um, and like i say i always considered myself a rock rock musician until until somebody pointed out that no you're you're not really rock your country but you're rock but you're so many other things and uh in idaho you know just like texas has this red dirt you know know, texas oklahoma that he's got that red dirt country then we really fit into that genre very well in that we don't fit into every genre perfectly we there's a unique sound to what we do and and uh even that last record I did, you know, I recorded it specifically in New Orleans because I wanted some help kind of identifying that. We've been told many times, you really got to nail down your niche in your market and identify your sound. And, mm-hmm. and I wanted some help with that, with the producer and the musicians and everything. And, uh, you know, I mean, I had the guitar player from Mark Broussard working with me on that record. And he was like, man, this is this is unique music. Nothing, right, like, right. nothing like what I've heard before. And that guy's... Yeah. It's hard to market. Like when I try to, in the past, have tried to book gigs and specifically say country and then they listen and they're like mm-hmm. so i i try to put the moniker of americana you know yeah and- right right it's it's a hard yeah. it's it's really not a yeah. it's it's not it's a unique sound you know i mean we talk about rocky mountain music uh you know we, i mean it's it it it's not really there's not that one genre label that works honestly right we've spent hours in the band van driving from here to there trying to identify ourselves mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> And how do we identify yeah. david yeah. <laughs> but it, but it's, good, it's a good thing though because like um literally today i got i was on the phone with the edmonton folk festival and mm-hmm. they they liked what they heard and you know are we folk 
I don't know that we would go that far, right. but they seem to like what we have. So it's right. diverse enough right. that we can go to different markets. I want to play. Else? I do want to play one of the songs on the show here for the audience to hear. And so you get to pick like of the six songs on new strings the ep is new strings available on all the streaming platforms under aaron ball what do you want to hear tonight what do you want to share with the audience tonight I, see i vote for damascus you guys, but you guys damascus okay. yeah all right we can do damascus a, mark's calm shots oh yeah i like it mark's the leader of the band tonight i'm the leader of the band <laughs> for the moment the, the mark ball band <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we're going to play here the aaron ball band's uh new release on their ep new strings damascus and we'll give it a listen here and come right back to you
All right, that was Damascus by the Aaron Ball Band. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I certainly did. And Aaron, I, I want to hear what was the what was the sort of inspiration for Damascus? And uh, you know, very very cool vibe. But uh, I'd love to hear you know, and frankly, a lot of your music. What was the inspiration in particular about Damascus? Uh, well, honestly, um, there's really two two things about it. But uh, gosh, do we get do we get all religious? I mean, we're not a Christian band. No, but you know, uh, I but, tell people all this. Huh? I mean, think about the birds, man. I mean, you know, to every season, a turn, turn, turn. Hey, that's you know, right out of the Bible. Right. I mean, there's a lot yeah. of biblical nomenclature coming into music, and so I think it's appropriate. It's not religiosity, but it's inspirational. Yeah, and I think that that song, as far as that goes, uh, if you want to turn it to the Bible, it's it's actually a you know the out of the book of Acts, and that was really kind of the original inspiration for the song. Is you know that whole. Uh, changing your life and becoming somebody different and somebody better you know so there's some definitely some references yeah i mean it was it was paul of course right saul to paul right, yeah. right? for those of us right. who are those of our, our listeners who may not be familiar there's a great biblical story in which uh, the, the the very tough guy who is became one of the most famous writers of 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 biblical context and uh, formerly the, the taxation guru of the time, Saul was on his road to Damascus in which he was felled by Christ and subsequently made blind and subsequently saw as those sort of fell from his eyes and realized that uh, he was now to be Paul and he was one of the most uh, critical, frankly, one of the most critical changes of any of the apostles and more importantly as it relates to his own writings and understanding of the christian faith but i think to your point the inspiration there being how how substantive change can occur and how people can one day be one thing but yet through through a new insights into themselves and into their surroundings into their relationships can drive that creativity or drive that innovation or even drive that change in their personhood for the better right for for all the things that we go through because for some of us, and my own listening of Damascus, it's not an instantaneous change as it was in the biblical context of Acts, but for many of us, it's an incremental change over time of our lives. And so I think it's a great piece of music that tends to mean a lot of things to a lot of people, Christian or not Christian. Right. Yeah. I mean, you can take it a lot of different ways. And uh, so, I mean, there was, that's really the, the basis of the, you know, most of the lyrical content of the song and uh, mm -hmm. pretty neat song. Well, look, as we sort of wrap up here, um, where can you be found? Uh, where can our listeners check your information out? I told them you're on all the streaming platforms as Aaron Ball, and uh, you can check out new strings. Please do, and give it a listen, folks. Share it, if you would. We'd love to have you do that as well. It's a great EP, and I think you'd find it. And by the way, if you also want to listen to these songs, we've put them up on Iron Gate Records Radio, which is our internet radio station. You can pick up the Android or the iOS app for Iron Gate Records Radio and uh, listen 24 by 7 to all of our great artists, including the Aaron Ball Band. But uh, it's all about your social media context, uh, if you could, Aaron, and where people can find more out about you. Yeah, so uh, yeah, we're on Instagram, Aaron Ball Band, um, the, on Facebook, the Aaron Ball Band, and then we have a website, AaronBallBand.com. Uh, with, there you um, go. And that one has, you know, ways to reach out, different ways to listen to the music. It has links to all the, basically everything's tied together in a nice web so that you can go wherever you want to go to an look at stuff. An interweb, if you will. An interweb, if you will. Yes. And stay an tuned an interwoven that. web. <laughs> yes. And, you know, stay tuned because, like, we're, we just barely, like, about a month ago, got out of the studio recording a new EP. Um, and we're in the process of writing and recording for another EP. And we're going to also be doing a song for the holiday season pretty soon as well. So we got a lot coming out. So that's great stuff to look at. Just go look at it, man. Well, look, I appreciate your time for all three of you guys tonight. This has been a fun conversation. I hope for our audience to give you a perspective on sort of a band. I mean, how things evolve. I mean, from my gosh, going out to New Zealand now that, you know, to get your starts out in the Australasia region region, and then go up to Japan and then cruise lines and then back to Galveston, Texas and up to, uh, you know, Idaho. And here you are releasing lots of music. And I hope, uh, hope our folks have gotten to know you a little bit better and uh, I hope you'll share this podcast with all of your fans because I think it gives a good insight into some of your backstory which I think is always interesting more so than things that might otherwise not be able to be shared as effectively uh, sitting on the web itself right so I appreciate your time tonight and I want to thank uh, Aaron and his 
team, uh, David and Jared, for joining us this evening on The Independent Musician here. Thanks again, guys. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. you. And we'd also like to thank more of our family. So um, Rain Song Guitars um, out of Oregon, right? Washington. Washington, one of those states. Um, The Pacific Northwest. Exactly. Um, My friends over in Turkey, Boss for Symbols, and what else, Dave? And in ears. In In ears ears and alien ears. Yeah. Well, good. Helping us around. Terrific. Those are some of your sponsors. I'm glad you mentioned them. It's always good to do that. Uh, they help you pay the bills, right? All right, guys. Thanks again for this evening. I appreciate it. And this is Mark Skoda. That was the Aaron Ball Band with you here at The Independent Musician. We'll catch you next week for another podcast. Thanks for joining us this week on The Independent Musician. Make sure to visit our website, irongaterecordsradio.com, where you can subscribe to the show on your favorite streaming platform so you'll never miss an episode. While you're at it, if you found value in this podcast, we'd appreciate you giving us feedback or simply tell a friend about the show. Be sure to tune in next week for a new episode of The Independent Musician, where The Independent Musician is the star. The star.